Hello, my name is David Wendler and I'm from the Department of Bioethics at the NIH Clinical Center. And I'm gonna speak with you today about ethical considerations in human subjects research. And what I'm gonna try to do are three primary things. I have three primary goals for this talk. First, I wanna try to provide everybody with a basic background on the ethical issues that are involved with and that arise in the context of conducting research with human subjects. Secondly, I wanna talk a little about the history of that process and where we've been, where we are now, and possibly where we're going. And then throughout that, I wanna sprinkle in some further questions I have. So for anybody who's particular interested in bioethics, where are the current research challenges? How are people thinking about them? And what more do we need to learn and figure out? So those are gonna be my goals for today. So to start, I work for the NIH, but I am giving you my own views. I don't represent anybody in my department, much less the NIH, much less the US government. So just to start, just a very basic brief background, there are different kinds of research. So there's very generally research is just can be thought of as the systematic collection of any kind of data. So if you grab a telescope and start tracking the movement of celestial bodies, you may well be doing research. It's not until you involve humans as the subjects rather than just the investigators that you start doing what in the regulations is called human subjects research. And there are lots of human subjects research. Economists are doing more and more human subjects research. I'm trained as a philosopher and believe it or not, philosophers are now doing research with human subjects where they, for instance, give human subjects different ethical dilemmas and see how they respond and maybe even put them in an MRI machine to see how their brains react. And then there's clinical research, which is the focus of today and the focus of what goes on at the NIH. And I think about that in terms of a systematic collection of data regarding clinical interventions, whether preventative measures, curative measures, or treatment measures. And obviously the real goal here is gonna be clinical research involving human subjects. And the ultimate goal of that, I take it, is to collect data with the goal of trying to identify methods to improve overall health and well being. So, starting at the very beginning, or at least what some people regard as the beginning, in 1747, James Lind, a British surgeon, at the time, British physicians were called surgeons. He was, he was actually a kind of internal medicine guy. He traveled, he was part of the British Navy and he traveled on British ships. And at this time, these ships were taking very long, six months, year, two year voyages. And in the process, just stunning percentages of the crews would come down with and perish from scurvy. There are reports of 20, 30, 40% of the crews in some of these trips dying from scurvy. And so not surprisingly, the British Navy had a keen interest in trying to figure out effective treatments for scurvy. There were a lot of proposed treatments at the time. It turned out that Lind was fairly convinced of some of them. He thought that other ones were probably ineffective and almost certainly counterproductive, but he wasn't able to convince his colleagues of that. And so he wanted to do a kind of experiment. So what he did was he took 12 of his patients. He tried to get 12 that were fairly similar given the amount of scurvy, this wasn't a hard thing to find on his ship. He divided them into six groups, two sailors each, and he chose the treatments that were being used at the time and assigned each of the groups to get one and only one of those treatments. So this is what I'm gonna call for a while the integrated model of clinical research. And what I mean by that is this is a process, Lind is exemplifying a process whereby clinical research is conducted at the same time and in the process of providing clinical care. It involves essentially clinicians providing care and simultaneously conducting research with their own patients. So this is the integrated model for clinical research. So this model has a number of significant virtues. If you're doing research with your own patients rather than a patient who just came to the clinical center, you probably have a better sense for their history, for their personality, for their background, for the kind of medicines they've taken previously. It's easier to recruit 
they're right there in your office, they may be more likely to know you and therefore say yes to your offer to enrollment. And all of this makes trials much more efficient, much faster, and much cheaper. And also, I should report, these aren't just practical virtues. These virtues suggest that we would be able to, if we did this, and we might go back to it, and that's going to be the point later, conduct and complete trials faster. And if we do that, we're going to learn things faster. We're going to improve treatment better, faster, and we're going to have fewer deaths, fewer sick people. That's a really important ethical virtue. So real virtues to this integrated model. So why haven't we been doing it for a while, as I'm going to suggest in a moment? Well, there are also some concerns. So one of the concerns is just a fundamental one, an ethical debate over whether or not it's appropriate or acceptable for clinicians to experiment with their own patients. So in Lynn's case, one of the common treatments at the time for scurvy was a gallon of seawater a day per patient. Think about it for a minute. You can imagine how well the people on that arm of the trial did. They didn't, they both died. But also what's important for our purposes is that Lind was fairly convinced this was a terrible treatment. And he thought that it was likely that these patients were gonna die, raising the question of whether or not it was ethical for him to randomize them to that treatment in the beginning. There's also obvious conflict of interest. Lind was trying to help his patients, but he's also trying to learn things. And then there's a worry that as a result of that conflict of interest, there might be a tendency to conflate research and care. We don't know, we don't have historical record. Did Lynn make very careful? Did he explain to these sailors what he was doing and that they were involved in a research study? Or did he simply just feign that he was doing clinical care for all of them? And as a result, there wasn't what we think of as today, at least appropriate informed consent. So these are the conflicts of interest that lead to concerns with the integrated model. And the exemplar of these concerns is the Tuskegee syphilis study, which hopefully everybody knows at least something about. In this case, clinicians just simply ignored the medical interests of their patients. And once penicillin was available, they actually acted contrary. They, for instance, tried to deny some of their subjects to get into the US military where they would have gotten penicillin. And they wanna do this because they wanted to collect data. So this looks like a clear abuse of the needs, the interests, the rights of these patients. And at least arguably that abuse traces to the fact and the reliance on the integrated model, the fact that these were people providing clinical care at the same time they were conducting a research trial. So as people might know, Tuskegee syphilis study went on for a long time. It went on for decades. It was well known. There were publications in prominent journals. It wasn't until the very early 70s that there were some prominent press reports that led to first questioning of and then termination of the study. And that whole process led to the development of the National Commission. This was the first presidentially appointed commission that was supposed to look into and charged with looking into and making recommendations for the protection of human research subjects. There have been a number of such presidentially appointed commissions since then. This was the first one, and there were a number of very influential reports. For instance, I do a lot of work in pediatric research ethics, and I think some of the best work that's ever been done in pediatric research ethics was done by the National Commission. They also wrote the prominent and very widely cited Belmont Report, and perhaps most importantly for today's purposes, their recommendations form the basis for current US regulations on human subjects research. So basically, the response here to scandals like Tuskegee and the recommendations of the National Commission was, as Selby and Krumholtz put it, to draw a very bright line between research and care, to separate research clearly and distinctly from clinical care, and to subject it to its own regulations and guidelines. If I were in the clinical center right now, I'd point to the building as basically the bastion of this segregated model. Basically, the way the clinical center works is that in order to be seen there by clinicians, you have to be either considered for in or in follow-up for a clinical trial. So it's all about research. If we have a patient who just needs clinical care, we send them across the street to suburban. So there you get old, um, George Arm Pike is just is basically the dividing line. It's this bright line between clinical care and clinical research in Bethesda. 
So if we're going to come up with guidelines then for the separated activity of clinical research, we need to answer a couple of questions. How is research different from clinical care? What ethical concerns in particular does research raise? And what regulations or guidelines are needed to address those concerns? So one way to think about the major concern here concerns the benefits and the risks of clinical research. So in some cases, perhaps even a majority of cases, participation in clinical research offers subjects the potential for medical benefit. I'll briefly mention a little bit later in this talk, a phase one study of a rare disorder for which there were no treatments. And at least the parents and children who were candidates for that trial very much felt that given the devastating nature of the condition, given the absence of alternative treatments, that enrollment in that trial offered a potential, an important potential for medical benefit to the participants. At the same time, almost all research studies involve interventions. They might be MRI scans, they might be blood draws, they might be surveys that expose subjects to risks and burdens in order to collect data that might be used typically in conjunction with other studies to benefit future patients, to find better ways for treating, preventing, ameliorating illness and disease. So this leads to what a lot of us think is the primary ethical concern of clinical research. It's basically a concern regarding the potential for exploitation of exposing subjects to excessive risks in order to try to help other people. And one way to think about the many and extensive guidelines and policies for clinical research, at least with respect to the ethics of them and the approvability of them is an attempt to minimize this potential for exploitation. So I'm not gonna go through this in any detail. So just heard a huge virtual sigh of relief from the people listening, but these are some of the prominent guidelines and policies that have been developed to try to address this concern. The Nuremberg Code, as people might know, was a product of the decisions in the uh, trials of the Nazi doctors after World War II. Declaration of Helsinki was promulgated by the World Medical Association. It was basically an attempt to try to address what were perceived as some limitations or shortcomings in the Nuremberg Code. CEOMS is the Council for the International Organizations of Medical Sciences. And basically what that is, it's an attempt to apply or specify the Declaration of Helsinki for research primarily in low and middle income countries. The Belmont report I mentioned before, that's a very prominent, brief, but very prominent report from the US National Commission. The ICHGCP is the International Conference for Harmonization Good Clinical Practice Guidelines. And those are guidelines that were developed to try to come up with a consistent integrated system for drug review and approval between the US, Europe, and Japan. The US regulations are the next one. And then also, Almost all countries that I'm aware of by now have their own national regulations or guidelines on clinical research with human subjects. So we took this, undertook, this was a long time ago now, and we undertook a comparison of these different guidelines and policies. To what extent do they agree and overlap? To what extent do they disagree? Where does it look like there are gaps between them? And also, do we think that the guidelines were sufficient to address the potential of exploitation that I just mentioned? Well, our thought was they did a good job. There was some overlap, but we thought there were some things that weren't emphasized in the way that they should. Some things were overemphasized. And so we proposed what we call the eight ethical requirements for clinical research. The references are at the bottom of the slide for people who are interested, and these are what we regard as the eight ethical requirements. So what I'm gonna do next in this talk is I'm gonna go through each one. I'm gonna describe basically what the requirement involves. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of the continuing, enduring, interesting, typically I think questions that need to be addressed or answered to make even further progress on implementing these eight requirements in practice. So first, collaborative partnership. So basically the idea here is that communities shouldn't just, and subjects shouldn't just be subjected to the research. They should also be collaborators in the research. And that involves attempting to engage the community early on before the trial starts at the stage of deciding what you're gonna study, what interventions are important, 
What endpoints does the community think are important? How should you design your study to address those endpoints? How should you conduct it? And what should you do with the results? So that obviously, if you think about it for a minute, raises a number of challenges. One of the hardest ones is, it's easy to say the community, but what do we mean by the community? Do we mean a geographical community? Do we mean a disease community? Do we mean a national community? Lots of different communities. How do we figure out which is the right one? And how do we obtain reasonable input? Do we just call people on the phone? Do we just ask people to contribute and volunteer for focus groups, for instance? And then what do we do with disagreements? What do we do if some people in the community think a trial is great? Some people think you should do a different trial altogether. So those are some of the challenges with implementing collaborative partnership. The second requirement is social value. And the important thing to note here is that we put social value very early on in the requirements. And this is meant to signal the fact that in our view, no matter how important the study is in other ways, no matter how good the consent process is, no matter how low the risks are, clinical research is ethical only when it has important social value in terms of having the potential to gather data, as I mentioned, frequently in combination with data from other trials to contribute to maintaining and or improving overall health and well-being. And for that purpose, and there's more and more emphasis over the last five to 10 years on this and recognition of the importance that results should be shared. Going back to Lynn's experiments for a minute, by 1750, 1760, it became clear from the efforts of Lynn and some other people that citrus lemons and limes were very effective at addressing scurvy. That's why for a long time, British soldiers were called limeys. In fact, unfortunately that, and of course it was much harder to do at the time, those results weren't widely shared and you can read reports. Richard Dana has a beautiful story of a sea voyage for people who are interested. And what you find even in the 1810s, 20s, 50 years after Dana had done his research, just scores of people were still dying on ships as a result of scurvy. So the results need to be shared. So what are the challenges for social value? Well, here are a couple of them. There are a number of others. One is whether or not the determination of social value should be comparative. So what that means is, do we just need a study to be important or valuable enough? Or do we want it to be better than other trials, other studies we could do in its place? And if we want that comparative value, which of course would make sense, it gives us more value for our money and our effort. Who's the one who determines that this study is the best that we could do given our resources and opportunities? Another one I think is very interesting. So I'm trained as a philosopher. So these are the kind of questions I find interesting is whether or not knowledge is enough. I've said it needs to have the potential to contribute to overall health and well-being. Well, what about a study that just to help you learn something? You want to learn about the way a brain, the brain works in a certain way, but you don't think that that's ever going to lead to improved treatments, but you find it interesting. Is that an okay trial to do and expose subjects to risks for? So, Here's the challenge is that doing this, determining whether a study has social value is really complicated and requires a lot of scientific and clinical knowledge. I've been sitting on IRBs for the last 25 years, and I'll tell my colleagues on the IRBs that the studies are ethical and we should approve them only if they have sufficient social value. And then they turn to me and say, okay, smart guy, does this study, does that study have sufficient social value? And Invariably, my response is I just have no idea because in order to make that determination, you need to know a lot of things and have a lot of facts at your disposal that I typically just don't have. And they include what interventions are already available for this condition? Are they good enough? Do we need new ones? How safe and effective are they? If they're really good and they're safe, why are we even spending our time developing new interventions? So what is the value of a new intervention? Does it have a chance for a greater cure rate? lower side effects, easier to administer. What about it suggests that this is good value and something that we per should pursue? We need to answer those questions if we're gonna figure out whether or not a given trial has sufficient social value. The next one is scientific validity. So again, you wanna have the potential to collect valuable social information or data, but it's not enough just to have that potential, you need to design the trial in such a way that it gives you at least a reasonable chance of actually achieving that goal. 
And that involves and requires a lot of things. You need to have sufficient numbers of potential subjects. You need to have the right comparison groups. You need to figure out which tests you need to include to make sure that you're able to answer at least your primary, if not hopefully your secondary questions and endpoints. You need the appropriate lab studies and you know, obviously you need things like proper dose and duration of treatment and the right outcome measures. So a lot of things that need to go into ensuring you have appropriate scientific validity given the questions posed by the study. This is one I think in the end more important considerations that often and unfortunately gets short shrift. So when I first started sitting on IRBs and data safety monitoring boards, I always thought, well, what's gonna be important is gonna be interesting, deep, scientific and ethical questions. And that's what we're gonna discuss and debate in these meetings. What you find out in practice is that a lot of the time in those meetings is spent bemoaning the fact that investigators are having trouble recruiting and retaining sufficient numbers of subjects and what you can do to try to increase recruitment and retention rates. It's not something that people in ethics think much about. It's not much that scientists think about. And so sometimes it falls through the cracks, but it's really important. You need to figure out whether or not you have enough people, whether or not you can recruit enough people, whether they'll stay in your study, whether they'll stay in your study long enough to meet the endpoints. Are there things you're doing in the study that are chasing people away? Are there things you should add to your study to try to encourage retention, to try to keep people in your study over time? These are really important questions that need more and more attention. So one brief comment here on an ethical requirement that some people might have come across, you may come across in the future. And I was just gonna give you a little bit of my thoughts on that. So when we're talking about valid designs for clinical trials, there's something called clinical equipoise. And basically what that is, that's the notion that there's uncertainty in an expert community over which of two or more interventions is best. So why this is important here is because there are a lot of commentators who regard the existence of equipoise as a scientific and ethical requirement for clinical trials. The idea is that at the beginning of a trial, you need to have equipoise in order for it to be scientifically and ethically valid to conduct. So what I wanna say is that this is true. It's true that if you don't have equipoise, then you have important scientific and ethical questions that you need to address. For example, so what is, again, what's equipoise is when you don't know which one is better. So an absence of equipoise is a state where you have reason to believe that one intervention is better than another intervention that you're studying. But then of course the question is, well, if you know that one's better than the other, why are you comparing that in all in your clinical trial? What's a value in the data that you're collecting? And then the ethical concern, if you know that one's better than the other and you do a randomized trial, then that means at least some of your subjects are gonna be randomized to what you know is an inferior intervention and therefore exposed to increased risks. What justifies those increased risks? Well, I think actually there are cases where you can justify those increased risks and you can make sense of wanting to conduct a trial even when you don't have equipoise. There's a number of cases. So here's just one obvious one. Imagine that some fancy researcher or research company comes up with a new intervention that looks really good, but it costs a lot of money. So we have interventions now that cost 100,000, 200, $300,000 per patient. They're really expensive. And you can imagine from a public health or a public policy point of view, you don't just wanna know, is this intervention better than what we have now, that's not enough to know if you're gonna have a sustainable healthcare system in the long term. You need to know something else. You need to know whether it's sufficiently better to justify the added cost. If you assume that the existing treatment is a generic now and is fairly cheap, then you need to justify by significantly added benefits or significantly say decreased side effects, the added and sometimes enormously added costs of the new treatment. So that's at least one case in which I think you could argue that it's acceptable to do a trial absent clinical equipoise. So again, the point here is we should think of equipoise as a rule of thumb and not a strict ethical and scientific requirement. 
fourth requirement is fair subject selection. So the idea here is being clinical research involves risks and potential benefits, and we want to distribute those risks and benefits fairly within and across communities. So the way I think about this to tell people is just start your trial by imagining that everybody in the entire world is eligible. Imagine everybody is eligible. And then what you do from there is you only exclude people from your trial if you have good scientific or ethical reasons to do so. So here are some of the questions you might ask. Should we exclude children? Is there a reason to enroll children or can we just do this trial in adults? Are certain groups at higher risk? What about if this is a drug that's excreted by the kidneys? Do we wanna exclude people who have reduced kidney function because they might face higher risks? What about studies that offer more potential for benefit? I was on the infectious disease IRB when they were enrolling and studying protease inhibitors, which we now know ended up being a tremendous breakthrough in the treatment of HIV AIDS. At the time, we didn't know that. It was a new experimental treatment. There was some reason to think they could be positive. And we had some interesting and important debates on our committee of, okay, who should be the first groups to enroll in these trials? Should we start with people who have fairly intact immune system, for instance, have high, relatively high CD4 counts? We thought that's a good idea, lower risks if they're healthier. But other people argued, no, we should do this if people have very low CD4 counts. People have very compromised immune function with the idea that they're more likely to benefit and they have less time to wait for new treatments to come online. And so this was, I think, a nice example, which I'll discuss a little bit later on regarding what we do about conflicts. So for instance, we want to minimize risks, but maximize potential benefit. What do we do when they come into conflict? Another one I think is an interesting question has to do with individuals, adults who can't give informed consent. When is it ethical to enroll them in clinical trials? So there's been a bit of a move in this regard over the last 20 years or so. So some people argue that this movement started with um, some advocates on breast cancer research and then HIV research where prior to that time, the emphasis in research regulations was on protecting subjects from risks, minimizing the risks, making research as safe as possible. And what these advocates argued is that at least in some cases, access to clinical trials offers important potential benefits to the subjects. And so what these advocates were arguing for, they weren't arguing that research was taking advantage of their community members and they should be offered more protection. To the contrary, they were arguing that there were too many protections and that more individuals should be able to get into more trials. They should be done faster and with larger number of peoples. So one of the examples here is uh, the GAN protocols. This is giant axonal neuropathy. It's the very rare neurological disease that I mentioned um, a couple of slides ago. And this was a case where there are no treatments for it. It's a terrible disease. And the parents of a number of these children put together a group to try to come up with a trial, try to identify a drug that they could test in a phase one trial. So this is a case where it was actually the patient community and the families who are the ones who are really pushing the NIH to conduct a phase one trial because they regarded it as offering important potential benefits to them. So it just exemplifies this shift, I think, that's going on in the last 20 years from a more of an emphasis on protecting subjects to more of an emphasis on allowing them access to the potential benefits of being in clinical trials. Fifth requirement is a favorable risk benefit ratio. And there are a number of steps that are required to implement this appropriately. The first one is minimizing the risks. So first look at all the procedures in the trial and see what can you do to reduce the risks that those procedures pose to subjects. So make sure obviously, hopefully it goes without saying you have a qualified research team. They're expert in the interventions that are being used in the trial. Also eliminate duplicative procedures. So for instance, if somebody who's in your trial has recently had a biopsy, can you use the results of that biopsy from their doctor rather than having to take an extra biopsy for research purposes? So you minimize the risk first, then you enhance the potential benefits. And there are a number of ways to do that. One is to try to increase the value of the scientific information. So as I mentioned 
earlier, sharing the data with as many people as possible is one way to do that. Another one is there's a lot of, sometimes people call ancillary unexpected findings that you get as you conduct a clinical trial. You're doing a scan of somebody's brain. You find out what you want to know, but then you find something else out. Or when you're doing history and physical, you learn things about potential subjects or enrolled subjects that could be relevant to their clinical care and providing as appropriate, providing that information is one way to try to increase the value of the study to the participants themselves. So, okay, we've minimized the risks, we've enhanced the potential benefits, and then we wanna weigh them. Weigh the risk to the participants against the potential benefits to the participants and determine whether the potential benefits to the subjects justify the risks they face. And if the answer is yes, and what that means basically is that enrolling in the trial is consistent with the clinical interests of the subjects. And if it is, then the risks are acceptable. If not, then you have what I call a situation of net risk research where the risks outweigh the potential benefits to the participants. That doesn't mean that research is unacceptable. It can be acceptable in this context, but you need to have extra protections in place. And the first one is you need to make sure that the social value of the research, of the information that you're gonna collect is sufficient to justify those risks to the subjects. Another obvious one we'll talk about in a minute, we talk about informed consent, is that the participants or their surrogates should be informed of those net risks and the extent and magnitude of them. So standard view, and this comes from the pediatric research regulations, is that net risks are acceptable. That is, it's acceptable to expose participants to some risks without a potential for benefit to collect socially valuable information when the risks are what's called minimal. And the way that's defined in the US regulations and a lot of other regulations around the world have adopted this approach is in terms of the risks of daily life. So the basic idea here is that if your risks of the research do not exceed the risks that ordinary people encounter in everyday daily life, then presumptively those risks are acceptable. If they exceed the risks that are ordinarily encountered in daily life, they're either unacceptable if you have a vulnerable population, say who can't give informed consent or you need further justification for them and additional safeguards. So sixth condition is independent review. So you've determined as investigators that you've got a socially valuable, scientifically valid study, you're gonna use fair subject selection, you've got appropriate risks and benefits. But now what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that somebody independent of you agrees. So basically the idea here is we don't leave investigators in charge of making these determinations for themselves. Not because investigators are bad people or corrupt people, but instead, because the enthusiasm, the interest, the desire to conduct the research can sometimes blind investigators to important considerations. And the way we address that possibility is we have an independent committee. So in the US, these committees are called institutional review boards. In other countries, they're often called research ethics committees. And these are independent committees that should have the scientific, cultural, and ethical expertise to evaluate the research. And this should be done before the research starts. And then it should be done at timely intervals as the research proceeds. So the standard there is typically every 12 months, there should be a re-review of ongoing trials. A couple of things to note here are centralized IRBs. This was something that had been discussed and threatened for a long time. It's now mandated under US regulations. So it used to be, for instance, if you had a pediatric trial at 50 sites around the country, each of those sites typically had their own IRB. So 50 IRBs would review it. You can't do that anymore. There's supposed to be a centralized IRB. There's supposed to be one IRB overall that's responsible for reviewing the trial at all of the sites. Another one, there's a lot of discussion about community members. So there's the thought that we shouldn't just have scientists and experts in clinical research. We should have independent people, community members, who might reflect the interests and concerns of our populations and our participants. And it's a question of how do we identify those people and how do we make them effective members? The last one is IRBs do a very important job and we have yet to figure out how to evaluate them efficiently and effectively. How can we tell, how can we determine 
how can we ensure that IRBs are doing a good job? It's an important job. They need to be doing it right. And how can we make sure that that's the case? That's a real challenge today. Seventh is informed consent. And just to notice that we intentionally put informed consent far down the list here. Some people tend to think once you get consent, nothing else really matters. And one of the points of this talk is supposed to be there's a lot of ethical conditions and requirements that come before you even solicit informed consent from your participants. Potential participants should understand a number of things, their situation, procedures, risks, potential benefits and alternatives. And they should be able to make a voluntary decision whether or not to enroll and whether to continue to participate if they do enroll based on that information. There's a fair amount of data that a lot of subjects don't actually understand all these things. So if you take a random sample of people who are enrolled in a clinical trial and you ask them, for example, what the risks are of the trial, you'll find sometimes an unfortunate number who don't know, don't accurately know the risks. And so there's been a lot of efforts to see if there are ways to improve the actual uptake of the information in the informed consent process. That's an ongoing challenge. While informed consent is important, it's not always required. Sometimes an IRB, the review committee can accept and approve a waiver of informed consent. And under US regulations, this is acceptable when four conditions are satisfied. Minimal risk, and I mentioned just a minute ago how that's defined. Also, the waiver won't adversely affect the rights or the welfare of the subjects. The research wouldn't be practical isn't a definition for practicable, but basically it would be very hard to conduct if you didn't have the waiver. And then if necessary and appropriate subjects will be provided with information at the end of the study. So this fourth condition here is typically meant for deceptive studies. So if you deceive people and you don't give them fully accurate information at the initial consent for scientific reasons, then you're supposed to debrief at the end and explain exactly what the truth of the study is and why you felt it was important to deceive subjects initially. So informed consent is important. What about individuals, adults who can't give informed consent. So these are considered a very important example of a vulnerable population. In most cases, unless there's good reason to do otherwise, you shouldn't enroll them. And when there are good reasons to enroll them. So for instance, if you wanna study a treatment for late stage Alzheimer's disease, you're almost necessarily gonna to have to enroll individuals who can't give their own informed consent given the nature of the disease and current treatments. So you need to have safeguards in place so these are just a couple of the prominent, most important ones. There should be a surrogate, meaning somebody else who makes decisions on behalf or along with the participant. For individuals who retain the ability to understand some things and indicate their preferences, then that should be respected. And that process is known as the assent process. So that basically requires that you inform individuals to the extent they can understand your study, inform them about the parts they can understand, and then solicit their willingness, make sure that they're willing to participate based on that information. The last one is, it's typically thought, for instance, to people who can assent that the surrogate shouldn't just decide based on whether they, the surrogate, wants to enroll the participant in the study. They should ask themselves, and this is called the substituted judgment standard in clinical care. What decision would this individual make for themselves if they were capacitated, able to make their own decisions. And the idea is supposed to be in general that you shouldn't enroll somebody in a clinical trial if you think, well, if they understood themselves, they wouldn't enroll themselves in the trial. If that's the case, then typically that's a good indicator you shouldn't enroll them. So should I ask yourself, what would they decide if they were competent? This becomes a real challenge when you're thinking about a research study with individuals who've never been competent. So we did this and we were involved in a study some years ago with some individuals who had very severe autism. And if you ask the parents, they would just tell you, I have no idea what this child, if you asked me to imagine what my child would think about clinical research, I'd have to imagine a completely different child in order to imagine somebody who could understand this trial. So what do you do in that case is, and when is it ethical or not ethical to enroll them in a clinical trial? Another buzzword, clinical equipoise, was the first one we encountered in this talk. Here's another one. It's called the therapeutic misconception. And the idea here is that if you study and do surveys of a lot of people in clinical trials, they'll often fail to distinguish between research and clinical care. First, they might just think 
I'm just in clinical care. They don't realize that what's happening is that they're in a clinical trial. This is certainly what was going on with a lot of the people in the Tuskegee syphilis study, as I mentioned. That's why it was a scandal. The informed consent process today is supposed to address this concern. It's supposed to make clear that people are participating in a clinical trial and not simply receiving clinical care. Everybody agrees that when this happens, it's a real problem. The challenge is one, first, what is it? What are the differences between research and clinical care that individuals need to understand? Or to put differently, what do you need to understand to understand that you're participating in research? And we could talk about that during the question and answer if people have thoughts or questions about that. But that's an ongoing challenge. And then once you figure that out, then obviously you have to say, okay, are there ways, say, improved informed consent processes? So for instance, people are testing videos and, and uh, feedback methods to try to inform people better and get people to understand when they're participating in a clinical trial and what that means and how it's different from simply receiving standard clinical care. So last one is respect for subjects. So this means that once you've gotten the consent and enrolled somebody, the ethical work isn't done. The ethical work and the ethical challenges continue over the duration of the study. That requires a number of things. It requires an ethically sensitive team who's sensitive to the needs of the participants, the interests of the participants, and includes and involves them in the study. It also involves and requires very careful monitoring of subjects' welfare, and at least on occasion, reminding people and making people recognize, participants recognize that they have a right to withdraw. Even though they've enrolled, that doesn't mean they have to stay in the trial for the duration of its term. Last one is what I think is a really interesting and important. So I've been using the term subjects here and we've used the term subjects throughout our papers and throughout this talk. And the movement now is to think maybe that's not the right way to think about the individuals who are involved in clinical trials. So subject comes from being passive, right? You're being subjected to things. You're being subjected to interventions. You're being subjected to risks and to burdens. And so the worry is that using that word has this effect that conceptualizes these individuals as passive participants of what's happening or passive recipients maybe is a better way to say it of what's happening to them. And instead, the argument is what we should do is we should try to turn subjects into active participants, active contributors, people who aren't just being subjected to the interventions, but they're part of the trial and they're actively contributing. They're active co-collaborators in the process of trying to collect socially valuable information. Okay, so those are the eight principles, at least our eight principles, our proposed eight principles for ethical clinical research. One thing you notice, and I mentioned this with respect to risks and benefits a while back, in some cases, two or more of these principles can conflict. So for instance, adding some procedures, let's add an extra biopsy, let's add an extra fMRI, that might well increase the scientific value of the data that's being collected in the trial, but obviously it may also well increase the risks. And the challenge then is we have to balance these two. We have to figure out, does the increased value of the study from adding this intervention justify the increased risks? Unfortunately, no one's come up. Philosophers have been trying to do this for thousands of years, trying to come up with some algorithm that lets them assess risks and benefits, determine when one outweighs the other, when one is more important than the other. Nobody succeeded at that, including some extraordinarily smart people who have tried to figure it out. So what do we do? So basically what we need is we just need informed, caring, reasonable people who try to make these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis based on the relative importance of the competing considerations. So how great are the example I just gave? How great are the increased risks? How valuable is the added information? Can the subjects consent to it? Is there other ways to get this information that would pose less risks? And in individual cases, we need people, for instance, IRBs, investigators who just discuss these things and come to decisions. And obviously what that highlights and what I wanna highlight is the need for judgment and the need for judgment emphasizes and underscores the importance of having 
knowledgeable, committed individuals who want to make sure that the trials are done ethically and appropriately. That that's a critical part, a necessary part of making sure that this framework, these eight ethical principles actually in practice lead to better and ethical clinical trials. All right, so that's a description of our framework, the eight ethical requirements or eight ethical principles for ethical research. And for the most part, when we wrote those, we had the segregated model in mind. And if you look at the history of the segregated model, I think you can argue pretty fairly that in terms of the goal of protecting research subjects, it's been effective. It's arguably been just overwhelmingly enormous, enormously effective. There are very few, there aren't any, there's not that there are zero, but there are very few clear abuses of research subjects over the last 30 or 40 years while we've been using and relying on this integrated model. So in terms of subject protection, I think arguably it's been a great success, but there are problems. It requires strict regulations. It requires a lot of overview. It requires a lot of IRB intervention. Arguably that has discouraged a lot of research, discouraged a lot of researchers. That's a real problem. The other problem is that by divorcing clinical research for clinical care, people have started to point out and argue that what we're doing in effect is that we're losing a lot of potentially very valuable data. Where's that data? Well, it's just generated in the context of providing clinical care. Whenever a clinician does something, interacts with, treats a patient or a person, you can think of that as a data point. So they give them an aspirin, they give them chemotherapy, they give them radiation, they give them a massage, they do something and there's something that happens as a result and that's data. And what people have been pointing out is if we collected all of that data in a very systematic way, this is obviously becoming more relevant and possible lately given the increases we have in electronic data health records and in all sorts of fancy computer modeling systems, that if we collected all of that data and put it together, we'd probably know a lot more than we do now. We'd probably be able to do a lot better in terms of preventing and treating illness and disease. So people have started to argue for a rebirth of basically the Lind model in a sense, not exactly that obviously, but the basic idea of combining research and care, or as the uh, this um, report suggested, embedding into the core of the practice of medicine, the collection of data, so that you don't separate the two. Collection of data doesn't happen in some other sphere. It doesn't happen in a completely different building in the middle of Bethesda, Maryland. It happens in the very middle, in the process of providing clinical care to patients. So, I think people, then the proponents are right about this. It offers a great potential to improve, to learn things that we don't know, to do better by patients. And then the obvious challenge is the challenge that we saw with Lind, the challenge that we saw dramatically with the Tuskegee syphilis study. How do we reap those benefits while managing the conflicts of interest that are inherent in integrating research and care and making sure that research remains ethical. So this is the real challenge I think now going forward. Is there a way to integrate? And I think in a large number of cases, we really do need to have more integration between clinical care and clinical research, but we need to do it in a way that's effective, one, and two, still ensures the ethical acceptability. We need to keep that track record of very, very few abuses, very few problems that I mentioned over the last 30 or 40 years. So how do we do that? These are the challenges. What kind of review do we need in these cases? When is consent necessary? So if I'm going to the doctor and they're just going to treat me in a normal way, but then they're going to take the results and they're going to combine with other results into a study that they're going to publish. Do you say there's just no added interventions or risks to me, therefore my consent is not necessary? Or as an alternative, do you say, no, this is now a research study. You're using my data as part of a research study, you should tell me that and you should let me decide whether or not I'm willing to have my data be so used. And if you think that, then there's a further question of what type of consent is sufficient? Is it enough to have a kind of boilerplate statement when you're admitted to hospitals? It'll just say, we might use your data. 
for research? Or do you need it each time it's done by an investigator who comes in and talks to you? What level and what comprehensiveness of the consent do we need? There's also this very interesting concern and I think it's a change basically if we go to integrated model of what we're worried about. So what I was pointing out before is what's consent doing? So what we're worried about in the segregated model is we're worried about never forcing people. So what we always say is we say, everybody can say no, it's optional. You have alternatives. It's always voluntary. If you don't wanna be in research, you don't have to be in research. That seems like the right approach. But now imagine you're the head of a huge Kaiser-like healthcare system or a national British-like healthcare system. And you're collecting lots of data from your patients and you're using that data to feed it back into the system and provide better care and to improve the lives of your patients. Now imagine that one of your patients says, yeah, I think it's great. I want those improved treatments. I want to do better. I want to be healthier, but I don't want to contribute to the process. I don't want you to use my data as part of that research process. And I don't want to ever undergo any added interventions. I don't even want an extra survey. I don't want an extra blood draw in order to contribute to that process. What do we do about that? How do we handle that person? Is that okay? Do we still say that it's always voluntary? Or now do we have a problem of free riding that maybe we're more worried about or equally worried about as we are with coercion? Another one of the real challenges that we're gonna have going forward. Just give you a quick example of this. This was a trial about 10 years ago that raised an enormous storm. There are just many, controversies, commentaries, discussions of this. If you look through the literature, it was called the support trial. And it was a trial of oxygen support for premature infants. And the basic standard, or at least the claim at the time is the basic standard was to maintain blood oxygen levels between 85 to 95%. And furthermore, at least the claim was made that there was no certainty, no evidence. It wasn't known whether it was better to be at 85. Should you keep your patient at 85, 86? Should you keep your patient at 94, 95? Or should you keep your patient somewhere in the middle? It was at least argued that that wasn't known at the time. And so what they did is they randomized infants. Some got in the lower range and some got into the higher range. So the study underwent IRB review. There's some template consents and they very briefly mention the risks, but some people argued you didn't even need IRB review and you didn't need research consent. The reason was because this is just within standard of care, 85 to 95% was the range for standard of care. You're keeping the infants within that range and therefore you're just essentially providing clinical care and you didn't need to get consent at all. Other people thought, no, look, this is with very sick premature infants. It's dangerous. It's a risky study. It's oxygen support. You need to have an extensive review. You need extensive consent. And you need to make very clear to the parents that this is research and they don't have to participate in it if they don't want to. So this is one of these questions. If we start to integrate research into care, one way to think about this is when we think about our standards for consent, do we think about it more as research? Do we think about more as care? Or is there some way to integrate the two in the consent process as we integrate them into the research process? So this is a challenge a number of us have been trying to take on over the last couple of years. And basically one way to think about this challenge, we thought what people will tell you is look, if we have these extensive research consent processes, we just won't be able to integrate clinical research into clinical care. It'll just be too disruptive of standard clinical care process to allow this to go on. What we need is we need, one way to think about it, is a more truncated, a shorter, a briefer consent process. So then the challenge is, is can we identify a shorter consent process that gets everything we need, satisfies the ethical and also the regulatory requirements, but isn't so extensive or time intensive that it undermines the clinical care in which our trial is embedded. So I've written some about this, so my colleagues, Scott Kim and Frank Miller have as well. So one of the challenges again, that we have at this point with the integrated model. Okay, so that's all I have. So just to summarize, 
I think clinical research is very important. I think we should all be supportive of clinical research. We should also participate in clinical research when we have the opportunity, but also conducting clinical research and enrolling individuals in clinical research raises potentials or concerns for exploitation. The eight principles that I mentioned is supposed to, it's intended to offer a framework for ensuring ethical research, for hopefully addressing this potential for exploitation. And the idea is that this is a framework that's supposed to address concerns that come before you start the trial, before you even start designing it, till you report the findings after the trial is over. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that there's at least this argument that we should, and maybe we are slowly starting to return to more of an integrated model where rather than having a clear, bright line between clinical care and clinical research, instead we combine them more. They happen in doctor's offices. We collect data from patients in the process of providing care to them. This offers dramatic important potential advantages in terms of the amount of data we can collect and presumably the improvements, advances we could make as a result, but it raises a bunch of old challenges and a couple of new ones as well that I think really deserve more attention and we'll do that in the years going forward. So thank you very much.